Right. What else do we need to know about glycolysis? Many references actually group the 10 steps into two phases. That is, like in this case, you can think of the left side here as the first phase and then the right side here as the second phase. So, many references call the first five steps as an energy investment phase. Why? Because if you notice, the ATP molecules here are being used up, right? ATP is what we can consider as our energy currency. But the moment that you use ATP to give phosphate to something else, that technically means, you know, if it was money, this is a net loss. You spent it. Well, that's what investment is, right? In real life, when you invest, you you get uh, you get money and then you you set it aside. Technically, you cannot spend that, you cannot use that because uh, you you used it for investment. So, for example, in step one, that's one ATP invested, so that's a net loss of one, and then in step three, that's another minus one. So, since what's only happening in the first five steps is a net loss of energy, that is what you can consider as the investment part of this phase. However, of course, the tides change now in the next five steps because instead of using ATP, you now produce ATP. And uh, now, to couple that with what I said a while ago, that you multiply everything here starting from step 6 by 2, basically, you get 2 plus 2 ATP, a total of, uh, let me write that, 2 in, plus 2 in step 7 plus 2 in step 10. So overall, that means you gained for ATP. So since you gained it, and in fact, uh, since uh, here, you, you actually gained more than you lost initially. Uh, you know, in terms of money, you can think of this as some kind of profit. That's why the name of the next five steps is the energy payoff phase. So technically speaking, the fact that you have here a net positive yield, right? If we add everything, minus one plus minus one is minus two. Minus two plus four is positive two. So that means that you are able to produce two ATP after the 10 steps here have taken place. So, well, we can say that glycolysis is an energy producing or an energy generating pathway, which should be the case because remember, since, you know, from the word glycolysis, this is a breakdown or a catabolic pathway. I did mention in my introduction video that usually catabolic processes are energy, uh, energy uh, generating. And thus, that's why it makes sense that we have here a net yield of energy, 2 ATP per molecule of glucose. However, do not ignore the fact that we did also make 2 molecules of NADH. Now, if we think of glycolysis as just happening in the cytosol or in the cytoplasm, this NADH is still not going to be converted to ATP yet because uh, the conversion of this one to ATP will actually take place in the mitochondrion. So uh, usually a test question will ask, what is the ATP in glycolysis? The safest answer is simply two. Okay. Now, another thing that I have mentioned in my introduction to metabolism is that every metabolic pathway has to have some kind of direction. And in order to guide us to, to go in that direction, we must have at least one irreversible step. Actually, you will notice that in glycolysis, we have not just one, not just two, but three irreversible steps, which are reflected by the single arrows. So this is one of them. This is another one. And then the other, one are, the other ones are double arrows, so those are reversible. Oh, we have another one here. So, you know, if you just use the number of the step, it's steps one, three, and ten. Let me write that thing here which are the irreversible steps. And uh, we can think of them as uh, the steps which guide us uh, to go to the direction of pyruvate because we think of this as our goal in glycolysis. Also, it will be wise to be familiar with the enzymes that facilitate that. So for step one, we have hexokinase. I would just abbreviate it as HK. For three, we have PFK or phosphofructokinase. And then for 10, we have pyruvate kinase or PK. However, it is actually well known that uh, among these three, it is PFK, which is the most well-regulated by multiple ways in our body, as I will describe uh, shortly after this one. And thus, since um, among the three irreversible steps, step three is the one which our body uh, actually uh, looks after the most, we can think of uh, PFK as the rate-limiting 
or the step number three basically is the rate limiting step or we could also call this the committed step of glycolysis. In a way, you can think of it as being called the committed step because once step three takes place, there is no turning back for this fructose bisphosphate. Okay, except for some rare uh, possibilities, usually this has nowhere to go but become two molecules of pyruvate. So we commit it to becoming pyruvate, thus committed step. So now, let's answer uh, that question. What are the things that regulate PFK? First, in the, uh, first uh, if we think of the goal of glycolysis, other than making pyruvate, we have to uh, uh, go a little to the future. So I'll, this is kind of a spoiler, but for those who have an idea, this pyruvate has a lot of uh, steps to go through after uh, in cell respiration and the end point of that is producing molecules of ATP or in other words energy and remember our body will always try to strike balance such that if it is already satisfied with what it has it will stop making that thing or if it is lacking something that it needs it will force the body to make those so for example we can think of glycolysis as one of those pathways that allows our body to make energy but what if at a certain moment our body is already uh, uh, is already uh, supplied with enough ATP our body would have to tell itself okay I have enough energy uh, there's no need to produce more so in that case we could actually say that the high levels of ATP would be a signal telling our rate limiting enzyme phosphofructokinase okay to stop and in physiology if you have a background on physiology we call such processes negative feedback this is actually the same uh, uh, same uh, logic behind how many of our hormones operate. If there's already enough hormones, then there's no reason for us to produce more of that or release more of that. And uh, the same logic is applied here in this pathway. Also, we have to uh, uh, remember what I said a while ago, that glycolysis is not just something relevant for the production of ATP, but also relevant to control of our blood sugar levels because if you uh, come to think of it, since glucose is the most common substrate or starting material for glycolysis, you may remember that it is actually glucose which is measured by our so-called blood sugar level, um, measurements, right? So we know that blood glucose is a big deal because uh, uh, too much of it can be hyper, that's called hyperglycemia, could be a manifestation of diabetes. Hypoglycemia would also be dangerous because uh, it could lead to intense energy deficit. It could, 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 uh, could, could give a patient really uh, a hard time. So as we know, our body has to have a good method or a good uh, hold of its blood sugar level. It should not be too high or it should not be too low. So for example, let's try to imagine, I have here a graph, the y-axis is the blood sugar level and this is time. So imagine that this is normal blood sugar level, okay, not too high, not too low. And then for example, we eat. Of course, in what we eat, there's uh, usually a carbohydrate portion there. If we break it down in our body, it will uh, result to a rise in our blood sugar. So, of course, our blood sugar will rise during the fed state, right? And, of course, since our body, again, does not want it to become way <coughs> uh, over the normal level, then our body must find a way. So, like, what's the response of our body? Our body will respond by finding ways to reduce it such that ideally you go back to the normal level so the response in the fed state is to try to reduce the blood sugar oh and uh, you may be familiar with insulin this is our major hormone responsible for reducing blood sugar so in other words i'm trying to say here that usually insulin increases during the fed state because it is natural for our body to desire a reduction in blood sugar when we have just eaten to maintain balance now 
if you want to uh, get that logic uh, uh, it's like solidified further in your minds, we can think of the opposite process. Imagine you have fasted, okay? So I don't know, for whatever reason, maybe accidentally or intentionally you fast, you want to get thinner or what, lose weight. Um, of course, that means that your blood sugar levels will go down, okay? Because you're not replenishing sugar from food, because you're not eating. Of course, uh, hypoglycemia or excessively low blood sugar is not a good thing. You might end up uh, uh, having uh, problems in multiple body uh, systems. So your body has to retain that normal blood sugar. So how do we do that? Of course, as a response, it tries to do something to increase your blood sugar and hopefully <coughs> returning it to normal. And increasing blood sugar is the specialty of our glucagon. So I can say that glucagon increases in level or our body secretes more glucagon in the fasted state in order uh, to increase our blood sugar because when we are fasting, our body would have lower levels. Again, the purpose is balance. Now, going back to glycolysis, before we forget that we are under the glycolysis topic, what do you think is the effect of glycolysis on blood sugar just by looking at the name alone? Well, the fact that you are breaking down glucose means you are reducing glucose. You are reducing blood sugar. So the effect of glycolysis is reduce blood sugar. Thus, we ask, which hormone between these two has that job? Of course, the answer is insulin. Insulin's job or, or, or insulin's role is to reduce blood sugar because during the fed state wherein insulin is expected to be uh, secreted, our blood sugar levels actually go up. So I could kind of say that insulin acts as another stimulatory signal to glycolysis. Insulin promotes glycolysis, just like uh, probably if you think of this one in reverse, we could also say a while ago that low levels of ATP will instead promote uh, PFK. Or, of course, in the opposite case, if we are in the fasted state and our blood sugar level is already low, you wouldn't want something to reduce your blood sugar further because that means your blood sugar will go way below, which is dangerous, as I have said. So, we could say that glucagon uh, more or less inhibits glycolysis. Just like uh, the logic a while ago, excessive levels of ATP inhibit glycolysis. So as you can see, glycolysis is not that easy to discuss, especially if we consider that there are multiple ways for us to regulate that. But I hope that what you picked from this discussion is that glycolysis, again, is both relevant for energy production because it is tied to cell respiration as well as blood sugar control because simply we are dealing with glucose molecules. Now, in the, in the next videos, we will try to correlate pyruvate um, to the other things I was mentioning a while ago. How do we convert pyruvate to ATP in the next steps?